There was nothing else at all in the whole world but football. Hey guys, hope you're well. Simon here from the Triple F. I was joined by Mike Riot last night to talk about all things FC St. Pauli, as we always do. FC St. Pauli is his beloved team over in Germany. It's his, his club that he supports for cultural reasons, political reasons, but it's also a club that is starting to, to gain a lot of my affection and affinity at the moment as well. I'm casting a big eye on how they do at the moment and they're doing really well and I'm really happy for them. They've got a great um, set of morals that they stand for and they're just a fantastic club and I'm and I'm really starting to consider calling them my club at the moment. Um, I, I feel like I've got to devote a little bit more in order to do that. But um, yeah, they're definitely a club that is, like I sort of mentioned, I'm just, you know, really starting to um, to be massively interested in at the moment. So um, yeah, we couldn't help but sort of talk about St. Pauli. That was a, a club that um, we have to pretty much talk about every time that me and Mike meet up. So apologies if it gets a bit boring, if it gets a bit tiresome, but um, yeah, it is what it is. And me and Mike will probably talk about St. Pally until the cows come home. So unfortunately, guys, you're just going to have to deal with it. We also talked about um, a little bit about transfer business, not too much, but we mostly just talked about the league sort of reopening, the big ones like the Bundesliga, like the Premier League, and just talked about, you know, the, the sort of the big games over the weekend and the ones that have caught our, our eyes the most. So I hope you guys enjoy the chat. Um, I always enjoy speaking with Mike. He's a great guy. I consider him a good friend. So it was fantastic to, to catch up with him as always. Uh, and I think it was a really nice, cool conversation that we had. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And I hope you're all keeping well. And thanks again for listening to the Triple F. Take care. Bye-bye. The football season has started, obviously, with the Premier League. That's the, the big one that I guess, um, although I'm not in England at the moment, still hear about English football all the time. And that's one that seems to be making the most noise. And I think even from a European point of view, um, the Premier League is is the one that sort of draws the most attention. Um, so that's, that's the one that's been turning the most heads. But yeah, there have been obviously other uh, leagues that are sort of kicked off as well. La Liga kicked off uh, Bundesliga and um, what's the other big one? Um, Eri Divisi, I suppose you could call a a big... I, let's, I, I was going to think when I was starting this that perhaps I wasn't going to start with this Eri Divisi um, section that I wanted to talk about with you, but because it's such a great goal and it's, I can tell you're itching to talk about it, um, yeah. let's, let's just get it out of the way, but I'm um, so there's a goal from Jorgen Strand Larsen. This is to all the listeners. If you've got the opportunity to go and seek this, my God, go and do it right now because that was it was just an incredible goal. So it's for FC Groningen and they were playing um, FC Camber, who are a team not that far from here, to be honest. They're sort of based in Leeuwarden, which is in Friesland, which is about uh, sort of about 50 miles west of, of Groningen. But um, yeah, it was it was a great game, and it was at the point before the goal was scored. It was up to about the ninety fourth minute, and Jorgen Strand Larsen receives the ball with his back to goal, does about three or four keepy uppies with about six men around him, um, and then this fantastic overhead bicycle kick and finds the top right hand corner. It's just incredible, wasn't it? Oh mate, it's it's one of the best goals I've seen for for quite some time um the thing for me is that you could see from from the build-up play that it was just it was almost like lump it into the box and hope that the ball falls but yeah when it dropped back to uh i think he probably one of the defenders or one of the lads sitting back he goes to hoof it forward slips the lad up top yeah chests it bounces it on the floor couple of keepy up his bicycle kick mate i mean he couldn't have put it into any better position as well for a, where the keeper had no chance at all. Uh, yeah, it's by far one of the best goals I've seen in many seasons, mate, many seasons. And I, I appreciate you bringing it to my attention as well. I watched it about four or five times after you sent me that link. 
I was like, yeah, that's it's something special, mate. It it really, really is. I I I profess to not knowing much about the lad, but yeah, I think he's going to be someone that I'll be keeping an eye on now because yeah, what fantastic skill when he was doing his keep me up, he's holding off a defender, two defenders back to goal. There was nothing else he could do, and yeah, just pull one right out of the top drawer, mate. Really did. Yeah, the thing is, when I moved to Honinger, I, I I did a little bit of research trying to you know get to know a little bit more about my local team and whatnot. And Ooh. he was a player that really stood out to me because I think by the time I moved here, he just signed for the club, and there was just something about him. I might be going over board a little bit but there's something almost Ibrahimovic about him just the way yeah. that it, in the sort of sense he's got that similar sort of physique about him big tall strong lad that you can barely sort of push off the ball but his touch is immense and his technical ability is incredible um, and and it's, it's almost interesting to see because I always always wondered what kind of player he was going to be when the fans came back. Because obviously when he joined his first season was during the pandemic. So he played without Ooh. fans and it appeared that he was playing so well because um, he didn't, you know, he didn't have all the fans sort of getting on his back and he was able to remain cool. But that was just, that goal was the absolute epitome of coolness. Just being able yeah. to do that in the 94th minute. It's just incredible. And I, I wonder, I, with all the sort of due respect to Honinger, I can't see this lad staying at Groningen for much longer. I can see him go into Bundesliga, possibly even the Premier League. You can see him doing well at a uh, Newcastle United, Crystal Palace, somewhere like that. Um, but yeah, th- this this kid is destined for big things. He's only twenty one as well, so he's he's got a bright bright future ahead of him. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's as you say, without the fans, he's kind of not got the the pressure to perform. First game back with the fans, and that's what he produces. You know, it's kind of well, it couldn't have asked for a better introduction to to that. I know it was obviously that they were playing away, but yeah, that that's the thing as well. It wasn't even like it was a home game with the fans cheering them on, trying to you know nab that last minute winner. It was in a hostile environment. You know, <laughs> it was ah, oh, just yeah, it really, really was something else, and. Yeah, as you say, everyone's got to go check out the goal because that was some serious text, mate. It really, really was. Yeah, definitely. I'll leave a link actually in the um, in the description below, guys. If you want to check that out, by all means, please do so. Um, so the Premier League, I suppose, like I mentioned before, it's the it's the one that sort of draws the most attention. Um, there's no better place to sort of go to next than the Premier League, but. Um, and I suppose there's no better place to go to than this is just the the team that sort of springs up for me, Mike, and it's West Ham. What's your what's your thoughts on West Ham's game at the weekend? I'll be honest, mate. I um I was busy installing my new bathroom, um, <laughs> and I had notifications Priorities. on the phone, the phone on the coffee table, um, and so I picked it up. I was like, oh, I haven't checked up the score. I picked up my phone and see the final result was four two. That was it. I was I was there reading the report and stuff. Now, i got to give full credit to David Moyes. Two seasons ago, um, I think we were up there, as, as far as the form table was concerned, we were up there with teams who had lost the most points from winning positions and teams who hadn't picked up any points once going behind. You know, you know what I mean? That kind of that situation. Since Moyes has come in and obviously had last season and now obviously kicking off this season, the fact that they went behind twice to not only pull it back, but to actually, you know, go on and put in a a really dominant score. um, It really says it all and and full credit to him. Um, Another another, uh, point on that as well was obviously the fourth goal scored by Antonio was actually his 47th um, Premier League goal for West Ham, which pulls him joint top with Paolo Di Canio. Now, for someone who was playing as a, uh, a, a, a right back and a right wing back at parts and a left winger, and he was literally moved all over the shop, he's now actually taken on the number nine jersey at West Ham and is our, pretty much the only recognised forward at the club. Um so hats off to him for proving all his doubt was wrong and for the amount of time he spent on the treatment table to to amass that amount of goals um, is is absolutely fantastic. But yeah, I mean, 
it was a brilliant result. Um, brilliant result for, for the club. Um, and yeah, while conceding two goals is never good, if they're going to score four most weeks, yeah, happy days is going to make for an entertaining time now that the fans are back in the stadium. What do you reckon um, West Ham are going to do without the likes of Jesse Lingard? Because obviously that's a bit of a big hole to fill, but do you think that they're going to be sort of ruining the fact that they weren't able to bring him back at all? Or what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, it's quite a difficult one. I mean, if we'd have gone lost at Newcastle, it could have been a different conversation we're having here, but the fact that they still managed to bag four goals, um, and it was from four different players as well. So Gresswell got the first goal, which is a left back, but then you've obviously got Ben Rama, Suchek, obviously picking up from where he left off, and Antonio as well. So, you know, as long as they can keep creating, I mean, we've got the, up top, the, the sort of attacking midfield regions isn't actually that badly populated uh, at the club. And I think considering they've not signed anyone, there are other areas that they need to strengthen. Um, I mean, when he was brought in on loan last season, I was like, why are we bringing in another sort of forward thinking player? And obviously he completely proved me wrong. So, I mean, it's big shoes to fill. Um, hopefully now Ben Rahm has been at the, the the club for a season and working with Moyes to actually um, sort of, Moyes to mould him into his kind of player and what he wants from a player. Um, yeah, hopefully he can actually step up. And I mean, it's big shoes, as I say, but if he can produce, you know, three quarters of what Lingard did when he absolutely came in and blitzed it, then, yeah, I think he could be the player to slot in, along with uh, Jared Bowen as well. He had a bit of a an offish time in the season, but, yeah, I think he could obviously step up as well and, and reignite the whole... Um, the league as he did when he first joined us and stuff. So I think there's players there to fill the gap. It would be interesting to see uh, how they continue. Uh, obviously, we're only one game in, but yeah, if they can keep playing like they did yesterday from what I've, what I've heard and what I've read, and um, yeah, I don't think he'll be missed too much. No. Are you expecting any more faces to come in in the transfer window? Um, I think it'll be a big mistake if they don't. Um, the fact that they've obviously got Europa League as well. Um, as long as, you know, we keep the players we've now got, I know there's been a couple of people that have left, um, Anderson being one of them, who unfortunately didn't really perform over the last couple of seasons. Even when he went to Porto, he only managed 10 games. Um, I think as long as they can... I think they're looking for another, another centre-back, which... Balbuena obviously left in the summer as well. His contract expired, didn't get renewed. So someone to replace him and bring in four at the... So we've got four centre-backs again. Um, and we're going to need cover for Antonio. Because while I was obviously just singing his praise, I did mention that he was always on the treatment table. And the problem is, if he does that, we've got no one to to step up. He is literally the last recognised forward we've got since, since Alaire left. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely going to need to um, to bring in a striker by the sounds of it. But um, when when I'm hearing about a club's sort of deficiencies to to bring in the right amount of transfers or the right amount of players or the right players for for the holes that you've got, it it, it makes me think of no other club than Arsenal at the moment as well. So I can kind of share your pain when it comes to to that side of things. And the thing is with Arsenal right now, it's um, it's it's leaving me with such a, a feeling of wanting to tear my own hair out where I mean I haven't got much left nowadays so it's um yeah it's, it's leaving me in a difficult situation and we've only got two weeks left to the window are you sort of feeling from a West Ham point of view or even from a St Pauli point of view as well that two weeks is enough time to to sort of do what you want to do in the transfer window or or is it a feeling of it's kind of now a little too late to to kind of do what you need to do. No, I think St. Pauli's done. Um, they brought in another lad before the weekend. We'll I'll touch on that in a bit. Um, and I was actually surprised. I didn't think they would sign any more players. Um, for West Ham, I think 
from a couple of the in the nose that I actually follow, and there's one really big one who's often quoted by like Sky Sports and stuff. He's he said there's quite a few irons in the fire. The stuff is in in motion, but with the board that we've got, it's difficult to pull anything off. Um, and the, the the regular excuses we tried, but <sighs> Yeah, it, it's going to be difficult and they'll blame the pandemic and stuff like that, but it's they're just hopeless. Um, when it comes to signing players, considering they're both big businessmen who have made a lot of money throughout the years and Sullivan have been a billionaire, it, it's difficult to comprehend how... I don't know if they're trying to relate their bit their business dealings in the past. That's how they've done things, and they're trying to do it in a football world, and it's completely different. Um, but it does concern me um, with how light the squad is. That if they don't bring in players at West Ham, then they're going to find it really, really difficult. I don't, I don't think they'll get relegated. But it's not going to be that kind of season. I think the squad as it is is strong enough to stay in the league. But the problem is, if we have a, a run of injuries, it's going to be really difficult. I do believe there's at least three teams worse off. And for, for years, that's kind of been the way to look at it. There's three teams worse than West Ham, so we should stay up this season. Anything better is a bonus. Um, it's not the way that a club of this stature should be looking. But when you've got Golden Sullivan at the helm, and mainly Sullivan, to be fair, um, you know, when you've got him leading the club forward, it's kind of the way that's been expected. You know, the, the dreams that were promised when they moved to the London Stadium have failed to materialise. And this is only the second season we've actually managed to get into Europe since moving there. And we were supposed to be pushing for Champions League. Last season, that actually happened. But I think it was possibly more luck than, than judgment with the signings and stuff. So, yeah, I... I they desperately need bodies um, mm. if they're going to mount any form of decent progress through Europe. They need bodies. Um, will it happen? Probably. But the quality of those bodies that they're bringing in need to be ones that are going to improve the squad. As, as Moyes has rightly said, and it doesn't just need to be a, a bums on a seat kind of scenario. It needs to actually be the right players. If you're interested in coming on the show for an Under the Floodlight special to talk about your favourite player or manager, please email the F 2021 at gmail.com or DM the F 84 on Twitter. All contact details will be in the episode description. Hope you're all keeping safe and thanks again for listening to the Triple F. Um, this might be my sort of dodgy memory pay- playing tricks on me, but... Um... I did sort of read somewhere where there, there might be a case of uh, a sort of takeover bid coming in for West Ham. Am I right in thinking that? Or um... yeah. So there's been a few rumblings throughout the years anyway, but um, this is the, the one where I've seen probably the biggest push. I think it was one of the old guys from QPR um, to the point of where it's actually been backed by the, the Ferdinand brothers. Um the stuff that's coming out from the club as opposed to the stuff that's coming out from the potential investors are two completely different things. Um, Sullivan saying that they haven't received proof of funding yet. The, the, the consortium, I can't remember what they call themselves, but they're coming out and going, we sent that weeks ago. Here's evidence. And, you know, they, they've got the funds. They want to buy the London Stadium and, you know, they, they seem like they've got real plans, but for some reason, Sullivan is feeling really hesitant, yet he's said all along, when we find someone that's got the best interests to take West Ham forward, we'll happily negotiate. His price on the club is absolutely astronomical, considering it's just the squad and the training ground, which, if you've ever seen West Ham's training ground as well, it's literally port cabins, as opposed to these lush training grounds you see at other clubs. Um and even championship clubs. I think League One clubs have probably got a better standard of training ground than, than West Ham. It's absolutely terrible. There's someone saying they'll invest. They've sent proof of funds, but it just keeps getting knocked back. So I think there's going to be a point where, especially if things start to go 
a little bit pear shaped results wise, I can see us ending up with a situation like Burnley a couple of years ago where, you know, there was fans on the pitch and stuff like that in protest. Now that we know there is someone out there that's that's wanting to buy West Ham, I think there's going to be big comeuppances if they don't seriously look at it or as I say, if results go the wrong way. If results stay fine, I think that just kind of dampens people's um, objection to them because how can you be mad at someone when results are going your way? But as soon as they go a little bit pear-shaped, I have a feeling that, yeah, there's going to be a big uproar and all it'll take is a couple of injuries and that's it. Yeah, it it does give me a bit of a... um condolence kind of knowing that there's another football club out there that's having struggles with their owners just as much as Arsenal are so yeah it's um it's a it's a little bit of a um a consolation but yeah it's uh what I would like to see is is just all football clubs sort of going on their way with with decent ownership and just not having any troubles at all but unfortunately that's just the way the cookie crumbles in football, unfortunately. Um, so just sort of going on to the Premier League quickly, really, um, the rest of the Premier League. But I, I, I guess you can kind of argue that most of the teams um, that you'd expect to win, apart from Man City and Arsenal, kind of went out there and, and pretty much did what they needed to do. So like Man United winning Liverpool, um, Chelsea, they, they pretty much, yeah, they have done what you kind of expect. Now, you're going to hate me here. I do want to bring up the Brentford result. Now, what I will say is I'm going to try and move on as quickly as possible from this for you. But I think the the Brentford result, I think, will be an anomaly in Arsenal's season. I genuinely, genuinely do. I think, buoyed by the fact that it's their first game back, and I think, you know, is it Ben White? I think the new lad, he had a bit of torrid time at the back and stuff. Yeah, I think give it a couple of games, mate. I think things will probably settle down a bit and go a bit more Arsenal, shall we say. You know, there'll be a bit more. They're not going to be pushing for the, the, the league title, but I think they'll, you know, they'll be there or thereabouts as far as European places are concerned. So don't get too disheartened, Arsenal fans. I think you'll be all right. It's just going to be one of those one of those days. Brentford will be back to the whipping boys shortly. Um I think the surprise result for me at the weekend was actually the Man United result, to be fair, more so than um, Tottenham beating Man City. Um, And the reason being, it's not the fact that Man United won, but it's how they literally turned over what is a relatively good lead side. Um, I expected them to win by a goal, maybe, but to actually go out and dominate Leeds, I think it was a real, real shocker. Um, yes, you can point to the Man City game against losing against Tottenham without Harry Kane. Yeah, you know, it's it's it can happen. Um, and I don't think City fans need to worry about that too much. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't think there was really many real surprises. Leicester picked up a win against against Wolves. Um, as you say, Chelsea beat Palace. It's all fairly... I suppose Villa losing to Watford was a bit of a... Mm. Anomaly after how well Villa did last season as well. And Watford been another new team that's come up. But as Could I you say, argue that, that that's perhaps um, the, the effect of having Grealish missing so early? Do you think that's perhaps a, a, a sort of Grealish-sized hole that Villa have got in their team at the moment? Possibly. Um, I think with the signing of Leon Bailey, who I'm surprised has been at Leverkusen for as long as he has been, um, I think him coming in was an absolute steal and a fantastic piece of business and real intent from Villa. And I think he, once he finds his feet there, I think he'll just take the mantle from Grealish. Um, but I think it's probably more that new... T- um, as, as I said about Brentford, the whole you know, first game back in the league and they're playing with such ferocity and they've gone out and beaten Villa. Again, it's another home game. Brentford were at home, uh, Watford were at home and I think that's probably more the case. I can see Watford will be another team that I think will be scrapping against relegation again this season. Um, But I think Villa will be comfortable. I genuinely, genuinely do. And that's why I think that was a bit of another anomaly result as well. Um, As I say, once Leon Bailey and the the guy from Norwich that they signed as well, um, whose name I can't remember. 
But I think, yeah, I think once those two start... India, is it? That's the one. Um, yeah, I think once they fit in, I, I genuinely don't think they'll miss Grealish at all. Um, he's a great player, but the players they've signed to replace him are, are, are quality in themselves. Mm. Is it just me, or do you get a sense um, of there kind of being a little bit of a hysteria from the fans, from the media, from the public, just in terms of when you sort of see a result like all of the results that have happened over the the weekend, especially in the Premier League, where especially you can l- sort of lay this claim at Arsenal's door, but you can at others as well, where a lot of the reaction has been over the top, where it's been a lot of, oh, our season's screwed. It's, ah, uh, we, you know, we, we're going nowhere and, oh, we're going to end up winning the league and just sort of going over the top with, with a lot of these, um, reactions to the games that have happened over the weekend because I certainly get that feeling I certainly get the feeling like um, as an Arsenal fan a lot of fans are, are believing that you know we're getting relegated and it's going to be an awful season blah de blah and I also kind of feel with Brentford I feel their their fans are kind of getting a little bit carried away you, you kind of got to keep in mind that you know you've come up from um, the championship and this this is not going to be this easy every game like this is not going to be this easy for you but is is that something that you've kind of um sort of suspected as well yeah it's, well it's something i've seen and the reactions and stuff have been quite alarming and i don't know if it is because the fans are back in the stadium so the media has jumped on board and but yeah i mean some of the reactions i mean yeah i've seen man united fans thinking they're going to absolutely storm the league this year and it's like Yes, you had a fantastic result against a, a decent Leeds team, but it's one game. We're literally wait till we're five, ten games in the season before you can even look at how things are going. If you're unbeaten in the first five games and you know you're smashing three, four, five goals a game, you might be on to something. But yeah, it, there's been some serious uh, overclaims. I think is probably the best way to put it. You know, players, uh, people writing Man City off after losing to Tottenham. And Tottenham thinking they're going to have a fantastic season, which we know never will happen. Um, <laughs> well, they'll just bottle it. Come Christmas time, they'll be bottling it again. But, you know, considering the amount of West Ham fans that I actually uh, still follow on, on one of my Twitter accounts, it surprises me how quiet they've actually been. You know, to, yeah, great victory, fantastic. Nothing about, uh, you know, we're we're on another European push again this year. We're going to actually make champ. Nothing like that. But yet from other fans that I've seen on, on Twitter, on Facebook and various other platforms as well. Yeah. It's literally like we're coming up to the last few games of the season, let alone just kicking off. It's yeah. And as you say, the media, the media just overhype everything anyway. So yeah. It's, perhaps it's, it's a, sorry. Perhaps it's a, an excitement of you know um, fans sort of coming back into mm. into the um, stadiums a lot more now, and, and you know perhaps it's just a feeling of, of this sort of normality coming back into our day to day lives. But yeah, whatever it is, it's definitely caused a bit of hysteria, and I think fans are like you say making these massive overclaims, which is um, yeah. which is funny to to witness. Part of me wonders as well if it's a, a, almost like a, a bounce from the Euros kind of scenario, because that was only a few weeks ago. And with England being so successful and fans all riled up and they're all back in the stadiums and the media is still literally running on the high of, of England reaching the final. And, you know, it's probably still that kind of that drift all the way through where they're still just writing the, the, the flamboyant headlines like they were when we, they thought we were going to actually uh, win the whole thing. It, they're probably still riding on that high, to be fair to them. But yeah, it's I do think probably the fans or everyone being whipped up for, for being back to that normality kind of scenario. So yeah, it's, mm. it's very overhyped at the moment. So a few games uh-huh. again, calm down. Yeah, I, I think it happens a lot more in the Premier League because if you sort of compare it to the Bundesliga where Bayern Munich drew and, uh, you know, by a lot of standards, if Bayern Munich draw, it usually makes sort of not really big scenes, but people know that Bayern Munich won't draw every game. People know and people realise that, you know, Bayern Munich usually get off to a pretty sort of dry start and then end up, you know, getting the sort of engines 
running and end up steamrolling in the, the steamrolling the league. So um, it's weird how the Premier League is sort of viewed in in one sense, and then sort of the Bundesliga is is, is viewed in another. Um, but you know, it was interesting to see that you know Bayern Munich um, ended up with that draw, and then Borussia Dortmund ended up winning emphatically. Um, it was just good to see that someone like Haaland can go on. And I'm I'm hoping now, because this feels a bit more like the Haaland show. I, I think last season was very much a Haaland show, but you still had Sancho there as well. But I think yeah. with it more or less just being Haaland, who is the biggest player at Borussia Dortmund right now, he, for me, appears to be the one that's going to be like the Lionel Messi of the Bundesliga. He's going to be one where all the spotlight is on. Um, and I really hope that Borussia Dortmund can just push for it now. Maybe with um, this new manager, Marco Rosa, going in, um, I think a, a lot of fans, and, and even myself, I thought he did really well with Borussia Mönchengladbach the first season, and then things sort of petered off towards in his second um, season in charge. But I think maybe, you know, if if he goes there at Borussia Dortmund and things click and he's just a really good fit for them, um, it would be great to just see Borussia Dortmund challenging um, Bayern Munich, who, like I sort of mentioned at the start of this rant, uh, start of the spiel, that um, there's going to be another team that, that that sort of challenges Munich's um, Munich's helm. So it'd be great, really. Yeah, I think so. I, the thing is as well, I think a lot of people have built Haaland up so rapidly. As people tend to do, they did the same with Jaden Sancho as well. Not necessarily in Germany, but more, again, the, the British media. They catch on to this player Chelsea have been sniffing around and all of a sudden this guy's got to get. But to be fair to him, he's still a young lad. Um, and the, the, the promise and the potential and stuff that he he shows week in, week out. Um, I think you're probably right. I think this might be, I say, the season. Um, I mean, it's not exactly as if he had a down season last season, but I think it's going to be a season for him to actually excel um, and, yeah, really put himself on the map of world football. Um, you know, it, it's too early to obviously say because he could have an absolute stinker, but... You know, it wouldn't surprise me if his name starts getting battered around for the Ballon d'Or because I can see him just literally dominating the whole of the Bundesliga. Um, you know, I think Lewandowski is going to have someone competing for his crown of the golden boot. Um, yeah, he's he's going to fly this season. He really, really is. Mm, yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, we sort of talked about um, Aston Villa making sort of decent kind of signings. And I think... Um, Although the likes of Daniel Marlin coming in for Jaden Sancho, there's a there's a big sort of drop in quality there. But in terms of it being a similar sort of profile, and I think Daniel Marlin, who did really well at PSV, I think he'll go on to do quite well for, for Borussia Dortmund. I think his type of player, that real sort of speedy kind of tricky winger, um, and, you know, he, he, he often sort of tends to drift inside as well. I think he. I don't think he'll quite have, like I sort of mentioned before, the stellar impact that Sancho had. But I still think he'll end up being a great signing for for Dortmund. And I think him, alongside the likes of Haaland, giving him that kind of um, delivery, especially with the likes of Royce as well. I think, um, yeah, I think Dortmund are, are going to raise a lot of heads this season. Yeah, I think I think this is probably going to be the. They'll probably push by and harder than they've pushed them for for a number of years now um one thing that they are absolutely fantastic at is finding a real young gem and and a gem from a, a leagues that okay sancho obviously came from the premier league but he was just in obscurity at man city a fantastic player and the talent was there but he just couldn't get the opportunity and they plucked him out boom and look how much they've sold him for you know they've made a sweet profit on it and do you know what they turn them over regularly like that um, you know, they bring in these fantastic players. Obviously, we can mention Duke Bellingham, but he's he is a quality player anyway, and it, people were already sniffing around him, but he's gone there for his development as well. And they paid 25 million quid for him. How much they'll sell him for in the future if someone comes, you know, the big clubs, like the, the, sorry, the financially big clubs come in, um, you know, and start sniffing around. 
they'll easily double the money on him after a couple of seasons. They've, they've got a fantastic scouting network. And I, I have to say that for the whole of the Bundesliga, they always seem to find quality players that you've never heard of before. Um, even all the way down in, in Zwei Bundesliga, the scouting networks and stuff must be phenomenal because the amount of players that St. Pauli have picked up that I've never heard of, and they were playing in three league or last season, you're like, oh, you're signing these players from the lower league. How are they going to be? And, you know, they all seem to sort of hit the ground running and show real promise and potential. There's none that are there that are kind of just drifted along. So, yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see the new players and stuff coming in to, to the Bundesliga, who I've never heard of before. And obviously you've got your connection to the Eredivisie and stuff, so probably know more about the lad than I, than I do. But yeah, as I say, you look at all other clubs as well and they're exactly the same. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, the thing is with this Marlin guy, I didn't know too much about him, but obviously he's sort of living here in Holland at the moment. And he did actually feature in Arsenal's academy um, as, as a youngster as well. But he, he he's pretty much a regular for the Dutch team. So, um, yeah, the, he's no mug that they're bringing in. And, um, I th- yeah, I think he's going to do really well, actually. So, uh, exciting to see what he does. <laughs> Keeping FC St. Pauli, my friend, your wheelhouse, your your team, your boys, how's things going uh, as a as a St. Pauli fan? I think if I said good would be a rather strong understatement at the moment. I mean, I know when we spoke previously and you sort of asked, oh, how do you see the season going? And we were talking about the quality of the teams that were coming into the league and stuff. The fact that they're unbeaten in the first three games um they the result flattered Hamburg but we absolutely dominated the the derby on Friday night um I think I've managed to just about come down from that um <laughs> you know after the first five minutes we absolutely hammered them we hit post we scored early they got a goal which was a dubious one for me i Still, even after seeing the VAR, I still think it was probably an offside. But yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. Um, but you know, they still went on and and McCain Ark obviously getting the double and stuff. Oh, scenes were absolutely fantastic, and it's so good watching the game. Uh, admittedly, on um, on a stream through my phone and stuff, but but actually having the fans in the stadium again. Um, and just hearing the noise and stuff in the Valentor, it's just fantastic. But yeah, I, I I couldn't be happier with the start that we've made, to be honest, mate. I think two wins and a draw is just more than I, I could have asked for already. So yeah, absolutely buzzing. The whole place, the whole, the whole vibe across the UK fan base is just fantastic, mate. It really, really is. I'd like to talk to you about McKeanock because I didn't know that much about him. Um, however, I, I think it was last, maybe like a couple of months ago. It was definitely before um, the season started, and it was um, during the sort of pre-season. But I, I didn't. Like, I think he'd been there a season before. But I saw this. It basically it was like him sort of modelling. Um, it was a really weird photo. It must have been like a promotional St. Pauli photo. I don't know if you know the one that I'm talking about. But no. yeah, it was just stood in a lederhosen outside of a really sort of traditional German looking house, drinking a glass of milk. And then he'd got all his tattoos on show as well. He's got his real like look about him. Um, but I, I didn't know. I, I just looked at him and just initially for centre back. I didn't realise he was actually a, a forward, but um, my God, what a unit he is. He's, he's massive. He is huge. I think he's about six foot seven. Um, so he's a few inches taller than me, which is daunting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the thing is, he he definitely harps back to the more old school centre forward. He, he's good with his head and big, tall guy, um, hold up play. He's not the most prolific goal scorer yet. He 
I think he pretty much scored in every game he played in preseason. He was smashing goals left, right and centre. And I was like, could this be? He played the first couple of games, didn't score anything. And then he scored the two in the derby, which, yeah, fantastic. Um, I think he only scored two in the whole of last season, but he was very much in and out of the team. Um, obviously, we had the shaky start. Then Bergstaller came in and he got injured. And we we really struggled for form. And I think if he's playing in a team that's playing well with, with decent supply and stuff, which is what, you know, considering Mamouche and, and Zalazar have left, we seem to have just plugged those gaps fantastically. And yeah, the, the way we're playing at the moment, we're giving fantastic supply to our to our forwards. And yeah, he's quite a menacing looking bloke. Um, yeah. But it's really stupid. I, I actually follow him on Instagram and he's always posting pictures up of his dogs and he's got these two little fluffy Pomeranians, I think they are. And it just completely goes against his, his general appearance. He seems like such a lovely family man as well. It's absolutely brilliant. But if you met him in a dark alley, He's the kind of bloke that you'd see him and you wouldn't want to mess with him. But right. he just seems like such a lovely bloke. He, he really, really does. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, he does get more opportunities again this season to actually, you know, play some some more games. Uh, Schultz seems to be trying to play him and Bergstaller up top together uh, with Kaira sort of drifting around behind in a kind of a three. It's interesting, um, but it seems to be working. Um, as I say, I mean, we beat Kiel 3-0, who, when that's your first game of the season, they had pretty much the best defence record in the whole of the league last year, and we turned them over 3-0 at the start of the season. Mm. Um, yes, the next game was a 0-0 and didn't really light any fires. Um, it's not like, you know, we played fantastically but just couldn't score. And then, obviously, we go and bag another three goals against our biggest rivals so yeah yeah he's uh he's a diff different player and I'm just hoping that this partnership with Bergstaller that Schultz is trying to fit in works and, and keeps going but yeah surprisingly both of the goals as well we scored with his feet at the weekend and not with his head which is not something he's very well known for but the techers were absolutely brilliant for for such a big lad yeah you, know, you expect him to turn like the Titanic but he actually played really well and the goals he took were fantastic Brilliant, brilliant. How happy are you with um, the performances of Eric Smith so far this season? I know we're only three games in, but I think we looked at it last season and, and um, as soon as Eric Smith was brought in, for some reason it really caught my eye and I was really excited to see what he was going to do um, since January when he was brought in. But unfortunately, just all of last season, um, he, he barely featured, to be honest. He didn't feature that much, but this season it seemed... he. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but he started every game, uh, yeah. and and he's yeah he, he just seems to be such a, a solid um, feature to to how Schultz is is trying to get the team playing. Yeah, completely. I think I think they they're playing it a little bit safe with him, so they seem to pull him off in in most of the games. Um, I think he's come off subbed and, and Aramu's come on. Who, to be fair to him, had a fantastic end of the season last season. Um, and obviously Benatelli as well, who kind of took Smith's place. Yeah, he didn't play that many games last season. He got injured, but there was something that obviously Schultz and, and, and the guys upstairs had, had seen in him that meant that they wanted to actually retain him and turn the loan into the permanent deal. Um, and looking at the way that he's playing at the moment and, and sort of being that key figurehead for Schultz and the, the, the centre point, of breaking up play and stuff. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, he really seems to to have taken off. So yeah, fingers crossed. He keeps he keeps it up and and he can stay off that treatment table. Is it a bit bit of a fitness issue that um, he's getting sort of subbed off towards the end of games? Or I think it's probably more of a protection thing. I mean, we've got. An, as I say, we've got Aramu as well who can who can fill that slot. But I think it's more a case of the injury that he had last season. I'm not actually sure what it was, but if it's something like a tendon or a knee or something that could potentially give, I know he wasn't, I don't think he was used that much actually in pre-season either. Um, so I think that he's, they're just taking it steady with him, making sure he sees how he holds up, giving him 70 minutes, 80 minutes and, and just not, 
making him go the whole the whole hog. And obviously, with a player in his sort of position as well, that pivotal defensive midfielder, he's got to be careful not to pick up too many bookings, else he ends up with suspensions. And uh, so I think they're just playing it cautious like that. If the game's appearing to be won, what's the point in risking him? So yeah, it seems to be the way that Schultz is managing it at the moment. If you're enjoying the Triple F show, then you might enjoy our other podcasts. The Magic Of is a show which profiles special clubs from all over the world to find out about their history, culture and fan base. Under the Floodlights invites fans to talk about their favourite players and managers. And the Triple F cinema is where guests and I review weird and wacky football films. I know it was a difficult sort of ask of you to do this, um, but are you still able to kind of give a, a realistic prediction for where you think San Paoli are going to finish this season? And I don't know. I, I, I know it's way too early to sort of say now, but I mean, your sort of gut feeling. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, it is a difficult one where I would have expected us to have been last season. Uh, sorry, before the season where I expected us to be. Um I wouldn't have expected us to be where we are now. Um, you know, the, the start of the season has been fantastic. Um, I would like to see us continue to, to do all right. Um, and then potentially, yeah, I'd like to see, you know, top eight, I think, I think would be probably quite a realistic season, you know, it's difficult because I genuinely thought you'd have play, um, teams like Verda come down last season and and Schalke and I thought HSV would obviously make another push. Um, Kiel obviously didn't win the playoff last season. They're now bottom of the league at the moment. You, I kind of expected those teams to be up there, but realistically, just looking at the results, yeah, Verda, Schalke and Hamburg out of the three games of one lost and drawn one. So it's it's difficult to predict already. Um, the league is so wide open with some fantastic teams in there. And as I say, people need to watch this, this league because it's absolutely fantastic. The football is quality and the competition is, is, is brilliant. So I'm just hoping that we can kind of, we can continue our form that we're on at the moment and yeah, just, just be comfortable and have another, a good season. I'd be happy with that. I'm not chasing promotion, but, Let's stay up there, you know, mm. stick around that right, right end of the table. Yeah. I think the way that I see the why Bundesliga at the moment is um, I think a lot of sort of fans in the media were almost daunted by the fact that Schalke and Bremen and, you know, these big dogs coming into that league were going to absolutely whitewash it. But I think we've already witnessed, um, and maybe it is too early to say, but I, I somehow just get the feeling it's not going to be that easy for the likes of those teams. I think it is going to be a bit of a, a roundabout. It's going to be a bit of a mixer. And I think, you know, it's going to be a really competitive, really competitive league. Uh, and like you say, I think this is going to be a hell of an exciting um, season. And um, yeah, I, th- I think if people really like and enjoy German football from the Bundesliga, they shouldn't discount looking at Swai Bundesliga as well. And perhaps it, but I mean, possibly even looking at Drei Bundesliga because you know the, just German football as a general, it's just it's just brilliant to witness. I think. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, you know, when I first started following St. Pauli, I, I didn't expect the quality of football to be anywhere near what it is now. So, yeah, I, I yeah, people need to check it out. Um, I know people talk about the championship being you know a really high level of of um, a really high standard. But yeah, Zwei Bundesliga is exactly the same. And there's there's quite a few big dogs down in that league now. Um, you know, so yeah, they, check it out. That's all I can say. Check it out because the standard is, is fantastic. Awesome. Right, my man. I think that's um, pretty much everything that we need to cover. I know we wanted to talk about... Um, 
you know, sort of British players playing abroad. But we'll have to leave that for the next show because I think that's going to be quite a large set segment and um, yeah. be quite interesting. And it gives us a bit more time because I think I only sort of told you about it this afternoon. <laughs> so it gives us a bit more time to do a bit more homework on it. So, yeah, it'll be nice to um, nice to sort of sink our teeth into that one. Yeah, I agree. I, I must admit, I started doing a bit of research and stuff into it. And it's amazing how much it actually opened my eyes. And I was like, yeah, this is something I've really got to look into from from back in the day to to even now. It surprised me how many actual um, players throughout the various leagues across the world um, are actually English and players that have come through varying academies and stuff. So it's definitely something I think, yeah, a lot of research makes. I think that would make for a, a really interesting conversation. Definitely, mate. Definitely. But um, yeah, thanks for coming on again, Mike. And um, I look forward to speaking to you again. And we'll um, we'll talk about British players abroad, mate. It'll be great. Yeah, no worries, mate. It's been a pleasure as always. Cool, man. Take care, Mike. Yeah, you too, buddy. Thank you so much for listening to The Triple F. If you could please drop a like on our Facebook page, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter, that would be massively appreciated. Hope you're all keeping safe, and thanks again for listening to The Triple F.